He's discovered more talent than anyone around, and um, they're all people that we just adore and run to get their albums. He's discovered um, Celine and Josh and Michael Buble, just to name a few. He is also writer and producer of some of the absolute hottest, most popular songs in music history, and he's sold over half a billion albums. Ladies and gentlemen, David Foster. Wow, I've never played myself on before. <laughs> what is it when you hear a singer that says to you, I want to I want to produce them. Great voices are what turn me on. And which is why I've been lucky enough to work with Natalie and Mariah and Whitney and Barbara and Celine and, and Josh and Boob. I, I love great voices. What was it like the first time you heard Celine sing? Everybody else around me was kind of talking. It was kind of a family affair uh -huh. and she was up there singing in English. She didn't know what words she was even singing. She was singing phonetically and um, I was looking around and I went does anybody else see what I'm seeing here? <laughs> this 19-year-old child up there that is singing, I've never heard a voice like this. And I was just so awestruck. I, I will always, always, always remember that moment because I've never had that moment again since. Really? With anybody. Really? Yeah. And how many albums have you done with her? Uh, I've done parts of all of her albums. Mm -hmm. So, you know, seven, eight albums or whatever. Um, and, you know, at, at her height, uh, she was selling 25, 30 million albums at a pop. Wow. It was insane. You've won 16 Grammys? Or I've lost 36 times. Okay, all right, glass half full <laughs> or empty. When you were a kid, mm -hmm. is this what you thought you'd be? I was a, a pimply-faced, uh, not popular kid in school and um, didn't do sports. Uh, I mean, I wasn't abnormal, but I was very music-driven. And it never seemed like music uh, was a was a catcher for me, you know, uh, in back in the day. But I wasn't a prodigy, but I was very, very gifted. And uh, my parents recognized my gift and supported it. We had no money, but we didn't feel poor. We grew up actually on Vancouver Island, um, quite cut off from everybody. When I was 16, I quit school. I moved to England, tried to be a star, didn't work out. Went back to school, got my grade 12, um, got in a band, moved to Los Angeles, 1973. And lo and behold, we moved to LA with my first ex-wife, BJ. She gets us a record deal, helps us get a record deal, and we have a hit that goes like this. Let her cry, for she's a lady. Let her dream, for she's a child. And of course, in true fashion, we have a number one hit, the band breaks up, everything falls apart. I'm left with all the debt with a wife and a new child living in LA in a one bedroom apartment, paying all the debt and starting all over. That was quite something to have a hit record and be touring with Loggins and Messina and 10 years after and be on a midnight special in the early, in the mid seventies. And then to all of a sudden go down to having nothing and having to start playing rehearsal piano player for $5, uh, being a rehearsal pianist for $5 an hour. Really? Wow. St. Elmo's Fire? Let me hear a little of St. Um, Elmo's. Sure. This is a, this is a, uh, for the movie St. Elmo's Fire that uh, directed by my friend Joel Schumacher and he was, he was so cute because when I played him this song and he went exactly like this. I love it, I love it, I love it! <laughs> <laughs> and I knew I was I in. I would have too. <laughs> it goes like... <laughs> oh. You lie in bed. Does it come in a dream? Are you, it is it a lonely thing? No, it's it's work. It's you sit here and you work. Uh, when you're writing for a movie, it's mm -hmm. great because you, the movie is your co-writer. Right. So you're right? looking at this, yeah. It's not right? a or just being told the story. Well, like what he gave me was so descriptive, mm -hmm. right? Yes. When you're just writing a song, it's hard. But if you were to give me a scenario right now mm -hmm. of something, um, just something, you, just give me something. You and to Yolanda on the yacht last week, um, having that in incredible breakfast where she brought it to bed and said, take care of your man and he'll never leave you. That's not bad. <laughs> the bodyguard. Well, the bodyguard was such a great thing for me and my friend Quincy Jones before I did the movie he took he invited me to dinner and it was a long table it was just the two of us he said you know you're about to do the most important project of your life and this was in 93 almost 20 years ago mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't know what he meant I didn't know if it was because of the 
the, you know, Kevin's white and Whitney's black or because it was just her time or Kevin was so hot or I didn't know what he meant, mm -hmm. but he was right. And yeah. it did yeah. end up being the, 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 probably the most important project of my life to work with Whitney at her height. Man, when the bodyguard, she would come in after filming for 12 days, she would walk to the mic like a racehorse, she'd rip her jacket off, no vocal coach, no nothing, nobody around her. She'd Rick. step up to the mic and she'd go, I play this. Take my life, take me for what I am. All that you are and everything that you do. And she just, and then when she gets, awesome. to, don't make me close. Ugh. One more door. And she's just. You know, it that was so and, easy. And your arrangement was just uh, outstanding. Thank you. Just outstanding. Thank you. You just did an album with Rod Stewart. I love the albums you've been doing with him. Rod was so much fun to work with. He's, I, I, was, He's his piano, I was his piano player in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I know you know him, too. Um, uh, I was his piano player in the 70s. I produced him in the 90s. And then we hooked up again uh, for this Christmas album. And he, he just had fun with it. There's a duet with uh, Buble. And they're just oh. like, it's just two guys singing a song. Don't you want it already? He's yeah. so casual. Yeah, he is. You, know? you uh, worked with and have worked with many times, and he sang at your wedding in Bocelli. It was a kind of a surreal moment. I was thinking, you know, most people play the CD of Bocelli right? at their wedding. You had, and we actually had Bocelli. Bocelli. Uh, you can uh, pull it out. And the LA, LA Philharmonic. Yes. But um, tell me about the uh, special you did the for special. PBS we, with him. We filmed a special. We took... Uh, uh, we did an album called Amore about six years ago, which is all Spanish love songs. This is more Italian mm -hmm. love songs from the from the 60s and 70s, and he sings them so dreamy. And we're in Portofino, in the square, right on the water, with all the yachts around. The lighting is beautiful. The buildings, there's people hanging out of the balconies watching the concert. And we recreated the album, uh, which will be uh, out uh, for Valentine's Day. Hmm. And uh, it's just perfect. Him at his best. You know, he doesn't. He doesn't love singing love songs. He'd prefer to sing opera. But when he does get in the mood to sing a love song, it's unstoppable. He is just, as you know. Right. I'm going to say goodbye to you now, but I'd just like you to... Remember when we were doing, at, on the break, we were doing When I Fall in Love? Why don't you sing that with me? Okay, all right. I'll try and even find your key and try and be a good, faithful piano player. <laughs> I'll pay you 50 bucks an hour. <laughs> when 